Uh, welcome to the uh, fourth lecture on statistical machine translation. Uh, this, uh, this lecture is devoted to alignment uh, of documents, sentences, and then words. Uh, so the alignment as part of these techniques are still relevant even for uh, neural machine translation. And uh, all of the techniques were highly critical for the previous state of the art, the phrase-based uh, approach to machine translation. So here's the overview of uh, today's talk. Uh, it all boils down to, to data. So we'll first talk about uh, data, the status of uh, Czech English data, because that's uh, our main interest uh, at this department, uh, the corpus of Czech. Uh, and uh, then uh, after uh, the effect, uh, after discussing the effect that the data has on the translation quality, uh, we'll uh, briefly describe uh, all the techniques. So we'll start with uh, uh, collecting the documents, so mining the web for, for documents, then doing the document alignment, uh, and then uh, going further down to sentence alignment and word level alignment. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, finally uh, close with some discussion of, uh, of the adequacy of the task of word alignment. Uh, and then we'll also mention what would be the linguistically adequate uh, type of uh, processing. So uh, first, a little bit of motivation. Why do we need uh, the word alignment or why did we need it for the previous state of the art? Uh, so the previous state of the art was phrase-based machine translation, and there uh, you started with some parallel corpus that was previously translated by humans, and you needed to extract uh, some clever type of dictionary uh, that uh, contained all the phrases and, and their translations. And uh, these phrases were extracted so that they are consistent with the word alignment. So the dictionary of phrases uh, was constructed on the basis of knowing which words in one language correspond to which words in the other language. So this is the word alignment. These word alignments need not be always one-to-one. -one. So sometimes they are one-to-one, -one, like this faster and rychle, or the full stop at the end of the sentences. Uh, but sometimes uh, these uh, word alignments uh, translate more words at once. So this Czech word nini can be translated as this time around. And if you know these word alignments, you can extract phrases, and then you can use these phrases to cover input sentences. And that's, uh, that's the way to, uh, to proceed with the, uh, with the standard uh, classical statistical machine translation. But how do we get these alignment points for the individual words? And that's the topic of, of the lecture today. So uh, the data is everything. So I'll first start about uh, discussing uh, the data that we have uh, had for our language pair of interest, that is Czech and English. And we have already quite uh, some history of uh, data gathering for this language pair. So I'll briefly summarize the history and the effects of, uh, of uh, the data on the translation quality. Uh, so uh, in one of the very early releases of that corpus, Czech 0.7, uh, we were able to uh, find and include these sources of uh, texts. So it was legal texts, uh, which was the European uh, Union and uh, back then the Czech Republic was part of the European Union only for a couple of years so that was not too big uh, of a collection and then uh, there were other uh, documents uh, except uh, aside from the the corpus that the Union has already collected then we were able to get hold of some uh, stories or uh, news commentaries, uh, so Reader's Digest stories uh, or uh, some books from the, uh, uh, from the Project Gutenberg uh, or Palmkini back then, so some e-books which were available. And then also the, this Project Syndicate, which is news commentaries, this project still exists, and uh, it's uh, volunteers, uh, journalists who publish uh, their uh, essays uh, and they translate it in very high quality to many languages. So these were the stories and commentaries. And then we also were seeking for some user supplied data. Uh, and this, uh, the user supplied data that we were able to, uh, to find were pre uh, primarily uh, translations or localizations of uh, open source uh, projects, uh, or desktop environments like KDE or GNOME. Uh, so these are not full sentences. These were uh, mainly uh, labels of many items uh, and so on. But it's, it is still some vocabulary which, which can be useful. 
And then there was uh, some commercial translation company uh, that decided to translate the English Wikipedia into Czech and ask users uh, to, uh, to correct these translations. And that was called the Davaho project. This project is now dead uh, because the translations uh, were not as good as uh, expected and uh, the users didn't uh, provide too many translations. But uh, in the early stages, some reasonable amount of, uh, of uh, sentence level corrections of manual uh, of, of uh, machine outputs were uh, were gathered so that's uh, uh, that's that source so here's the composition of the data and in some uh, we obtained about 1.4 million uh, sentence pairs uh, and uh, in number of tokens uh, in one of the uh, languages it was about 21 million uh, tokens uh, so uh, you see that the uh, the legal texts were more than uh, or almost two thirds of, of the data, uh, and then the stories were like uh, eight percent for the news comment, uh, eight percent for the Reader's Digest stories, uh, seven percent for uh, the news commentaries. Uh, the uh, the community supplied localization texts uh, were quite uh, substantial or 11% uh, in total uh, in terms of uh, sentences, uh, but they were very small, uh, less than 2% in, in terms of words. So that just highlights that uh, the domain of, of these translations was, uh, was not good for uh, translating uh, normal long uh, sentences. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, let me focus a little bit on the community translations. Uh, the Navajo project uh, was the uh, anonymous uh, corrections of machine translated Wikipedia. Uh, as you know, uh, Wikipedia is very, or Wikipedists are very picky about what gets to the Wikipedia itself. So it was not allowed to be uh, part of Wikipedia. It was like a totally separate web page. So not many people learned about it. Uh, and, uh, but still, it, it was uh, getting some attention. And about 2,000 segments uh, were corrected uh, every month. So we manually evaluated some of those, and the uh, uh, the result was uh, quite promising. Uh, so about 70% uh, were precise and flawless translations, and uh, about five more percent were also like reasonably good translations. And uh, there were some sentences, 7% which were not translated at all, so people just opened it and clicked yes without doing any edits. Some of them were partial, and some were imprecise, and uh, some were generated by other machine translation systems. Systems, uh, and the vandalism level was pretty low, uh, below 3%, and that's, that's good. So if we would be able to uh, separate uh, the good translations from the bad translations, which is a difficult exercise on its own, then it would be uh, possible to obtain uh, about 75% uh, uh, of, uh, of, of that volume into the data collection. Uh, the uh, community supply data, uh, if it's not anonymous, if it's people who sign in into the system, uh, uh, then it's suddenly of perfect quality. So the KD and GNOME localizations, uh, the uh, people contributing under their own name uh, really try hard. They may be uh, using uh, some nicknames, but still uh, they are part of the community. So they do want uh, to have a, a good uh, impression on the, um, on the community. So there's obviously no vandalism and the uh, uh, quality is almost professional. Uh, so this is, uh, this is very good source, but the domain is different. It's only very short, uh, very short segments. Uh, the, the thing that we noticed, uh, though, when we were collecting this data, uh, was that uh, there are many more texts available that already have translations in the Internet. Uh, just the licensing conditions are, are not quite clear. Uh, so uh, the bolded uh, lines, uh, the professional translations, uh, and the community translations are what we included in that release of Cheng back then. Uh, and uh, you see that it is about uh, 21 uh, or 22 million uh, tokens. Uh, but uh, another uh, 28 million tokens could be obtained if, if we uh, use community translations of proprietary texts and uh, if we use other proprietary translations that we just found somewhere but uh, that had no indication of, uh, of the license. Um, so uh, the, uh, you see that uh, the, uh, the available data is much larger uh, than uh, what is labeled for uh, reuse uh, and, uh, and suitable for uh, uh, like explicitly marked that it can be used for, uh, for uh, training uh, of machine translation systems. 
this is just a, a, a call to action uh, to everybody who is uh, gathering any data. Uh, the, the situation has changed a lot in the last 10 years. So people are now uh, quite used to labeling uh, the, uh, the licenses for the data. But please do so and please use permissive licenses. If you do not, uh, uh, if you do not uh, provide any license tag, uh, then uh, your data may not be uh, usable for, uh, for good purposes. Uh, because just there is uh, like legal uncertainty. Uh, the Czech uh, authorship law is, is uh, good in this respect because it allows us to use all the data for research and non-commercial purposes. And uh, that's, that's something that we uh, have been uh, relying on for uh, the past years. So uh, now let's talk about the effect uh, that the training data has on translation quality. So uh, this is uh, the total data that we had in 2008. Uh, we have discussed uh, this in-domain and professional, uh, this professional translation. Uh, so uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is the legal text uh, that we had and the stories. Uh, then uh, there is some out-of-domain professional translation. Uh, then we have the community supplied uh, data with proper copyright labeling. Uh, that's very small, as you see. So this is, this is the uh, remark I've made a, a second ago uh, that people were not used to uh, label their data uh, with copyright uh, tags. Uh, and uh, then we have this uh, unclear status of the data. It's community supplied, uh, uh, but it's not labeled. Uh, it's based on uh, some proprietary text. Uh, probably you may be asking, what is this large data source? Uh, the community has supplied the translations, and the original texts are of uh, proprietary status. Uh, obviously, it's subtitles. So uh, if you uh, are watching a movie, uh, you are legally allowed to, uh, to watch the movie and enjoy it. Uh, but you uh, actually should not be taking notes, and you should not be translating the content of the movie unless you have the permission uh, of the company that created the movie. Uh, so uh, this is uh, this is uh, pretty annoying. All the subtitles that were created uh, by listening to the movies and writing down the source uh, and translating into the many target languages, all these uh, subtitles stand in in like shaky legal position. Uh, the uh, but uh, everybody uh, uses uh, these subtitles, everybody relies on them, and in the Czech Republic, uh, uh, for the research and non-commercial purposes, it's, it's actually good to uh, go. So, uh, in the following, uh, I'll uh, show the effect uh, of uh, uh, the different subsets of the training data on the translation quality. Uh, and uh, for this type of evaluation, uh, I have two test sets. So I have a test set of news like sentences. That's uh, the in-domain test set, uh, which will be denoted uh, in, in green with uh, green whiskers. And then I will also have like out of domain test set, other texts that I want to be translated, but they do not match any of the uh, training data very well. And there's the out of domain uh, test set. And I'll be uh, plotting always uh, this, uh, this uh, pie chart, uh, indicating which of uh, the training data did I use for that. Uh, so uh, one of these uh, subsets will be the green part, the in-domain, which is professional translation that matches the test set, uh, the in-domain test set. Then the black part is uh, professional translations, uh, prof uh, but uh, not related to the domain uh, that much. So uh, it's the proprietary data. And then uh, the uh, subtitles, there's the red part. Uh, which is uh, not very much uh, for the domain of, uh, of interest. And then the community uh, supplied and correctly labeled uh, uh, contribution, that's the very small fraction, the, uh, the yellow uh, thin triangle. Uh, so uh, the two axes uh, on which I'm going to, uh, to uh, observe the translation quality are Blair, which is automatically estimated translation quality of the whole sentences. And another thing is the out of vocabulary rate. So the percentage of words of the source that uh, are not covered in, uh, in any way uh, so that the system cannot translate. Uh, uh, so obviously the best systems would appear in this part of the graph where you have the highest estimated translation quality uh, and uh, uh, then uh, uh, the, the uh, out of vocabulary rate is the lowest. 
So here is our first uh, run. If we rely only on the correctly labeled community uh, supply translations, which is a very small uh, fraction of the data, uh, the BLESS score will be terribly low, uh, and the out of vocabulary rate will be about 5%. So 5% of words will not be translated, and you, uh, you cannot read the translations. They, they don't make much sense. Then uh, we can add uh, the uh, other community uh, contribution, the subtitles. These do not match the domain of interest, so the translation uh, quality is not uh, getting much better. We have uh, significantly reduced the out of vocabulary rate, so that's, that's good. If we include uh, the proprietary translations which are out of the domain, then the translation quality is a little bit better. So maybe the sequences of words are more common. Uh, the sentences are a little bit well formed, uh, tiny little bit. Uh, and uh, just uh, the vocabulary rate uh, is reduced to a similar uh, level. And if we, uh, if we use all these data sets except for the in-domain uh, uh, in domain training data, then we are at BLEA of 9 and the uh, lowest uh, uh, out of vocabulary rate so far. If you can get a hold of training data within the domain, then suddenly uh, your translation quality is so much better. Uh, so this is always the, the ideal situation, that you have your, uh, you have your training data uh, in the domain of, uh, of the test set of uh, interest. Uh, you can still extend your collection. If you extend your collection with professional translations, uh, you are not damaging the, uh, the sentence quality much. Uh, and uh, if you are including uh, also the outdoor domain data and uh, community supplied, not so uh, perfect translations, uh, you are reducing the vocabulary uh, uh, problem, the out vocabulary rate, uh, but uh, you can a little bit move outside of the ideal wording of sentences, uh, so the uh, the translation quality can uh, uh, can reduce a little. But you see that the whiskers overlap, and uh, it's uh, anyway automatically estimated translation quality. So we cannot rely on that uh, on the blind score too much. So this is the in-domain setting. For an for a non-domain, you should use the in-domain training data. But if you are running out of the domain, then the situation is slightly different. Uh, out of domain, uh, well, the little community translation uh, uh, translation uh, set uh, provides very low blast score and very high out of vocabulary rate. If you use the in-domain training data, then suddenly the translation quality is also bad, and it even uh, vocabulary-wise, it does not quite match. So the in-domain training data uh, is of little use uh, for for the out of domain, or can be of little use for the out of domain setting. Um, then we have uh, two more uh, plots here. One is when we include professional translation and uh, when we use all the professional translations that we have. And here we have uh, all the community translations. You see that the community translations are maybe even more out of domain for this out of domain data set, uh, or uh, they, uh, they are uh, like not, uh, not, not nice and fluent sentences. So the blend scores are somewhat higher uh, for the per professional translations, uh, but the vocabulary rate is, uh, uh, the out of vocabulary rate is uh, about the same. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, the, the final plot here, and that's using all the data. And the message is that if you do not know your domain, use all the data that you can, uh, because that will give you the best blast score, the best translation quality, and it will also give you the lowest out of vocabulary rate. So if you know your domain, uh, it is uh, good to use uh, primarily the in-domain data and carefully check if adding more will help or not. Uh, if you do not know your domain, use everything that you have. This is something to be, uh, to be expected, but still uh, we, we evaluated it uh, carefully. Yeah. So here is the timeline of Cheng uh, over the uh, now uh, 14 years uh, of, of development, actually. And uh, this year is uh, 2020. We have released uh, the version 2.0. And uh, this version 2.0 is, is already getting pretty large. We rely on genuine parallel text. Uh, that's about 61 million sentence pairs, uh, uh, or uh, more than a half a gigawatt. Uh, in uh, Czech and English. And then we also use a large collection of synthetic texts. So that is text which uh, originates in one of the languages only. And we machine translated it with uh, our uh, 2018 uh, system, which performs 
comparably to humans, according to some estimates. Uh, so we trust the quality of these uh, translations quite a bit. Uh, and so there is some, uh, a little bit more than two gigahertz uh, per language uh, of synthetic text. So uh, if you want to, uh, to show off with some numbers, you can say that Cheng uh, 2.0 has five gigahertz of, of words uh, uh, Czech English uh, combined. So here is the, the history, and you see that we have been gradually uh, growing the corpus and then also regularly shrinking it with some filtering uh, because uh, that's an important part of, uh, of the exercise to, uh, to remove badly translated sentences or misaligned sentences. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is what we have been doing. So the uh, previous release was 1.7. That was filtering of, uh, of the previously released uh, setup. And also, I would like to highlight that this uh, version 1.6 uh, included, that still included the heavy linguistic annotation, automatically uh, processing. Uh, uh, we were uh, providing syntactic trees uh, at the shallow syntax and deep syntax, and also word alignments and uh, the alignments of uh, of content words uh, at the textogrammatical layer. So uh, this, uh, this release 1.6 uh, contains essentially the same uh, uh, parallel uh, data as the current release, the genuine parallel data. It also includes the heavy linguistic annotation, but it does not include the large uh, synthetic text uh, these days. Uh, and the tools for processing are, are Docker, so they should be like safe for, for the future. It should be still possible to run this, uh, this processing on, uh, on the new data. Uh, but obviously it is, uh, it is computationally uh, quite heavy to do all these analysis for all the text. So that's why we don't provide it. Uh, and these days there is uh, not so uh, strong interest in, in uh, linguistic annotations. Uh, it will come back, but uh, not, not this year. So that's, uh, that's the history of Cheng. And now let's uh, briefly uh, review all the methods uh, that are needed uh, if you want to uh, end up with a corpus that is uh, automatically sentence and word level aligned. Uh, so we first need to get the text from somewhere. And the web is an ideal source. So people have been trying to, to mine the web for uh, many uh, years already. Uh, so the, the very simple idea that was tested in one of the uh, theses in, in Zarbiken was uh, uh, to start with just the two language names. So you would uh, tell the program, I need a Czech and English parallel corpus. And uh, the program would do everything automatically. It would uh, first uh, look up in Wikipedia what these languages are. It would download some sample pages in that language because Wikipedia is, is split according to language version. It would train language identification for these two languages. It would also know uh, the uh, the name of, uh, of the languages, uh, and then it would search for web pages in English containing the word Chesky and vice versa. Uh, so uh, search engines normally allow you to search for uh, the languages, uh, search for uh, pages in a particular language, so this is the trick. Uh, and then you just need to somehow process and, and clean up the links that you obtained. Uh, a complete and, and still working pipeline, uh, so the, a tool which is still in, in heavy use today is this Bitexter. Uh, so that's something that I can highly recommend. There were also European projects uh, on that, and we had also uh, a student software project uh, on uh, gathering uh, the data. Uh, so that's uh, and that's uh, uh, the the uh, the goal of finding parallel texts. Uh, it turned out in our experiments uh, that uh, actually getting the seed URLs is the problem. So if you use the search engines as as a way to get these URLs, they will stop uh, re returning any results after 600 uh, responses uh, or so. So uh, that's why uh, people then uh, moved to. As, uh, the common crawl or other uh, other resources like uh, s uh, scanning the whole web uh, because there you can uh, find the text better. I would also like to highlight another stream of uh, of getting the sources. Uh, so either you can be searching for really parallel texts or you can be trying to exploit quasi comparable or comparable corpora. Uh, so these are texts on the same topic. Uh, and uh, uh, but they are written independently of each uh, other. So all the Wikipedia pages are of this nature. So you know that uh, if you uh, search for uh, the Wikipedia uh, page on Prague, the content in Czech will be quite different. It will be there will be some 
overlap in content, but no overlap in wording uh, uh, between the Czech version and the English version. And that's also because the target uh, audience for these two languages is, is different. Uh, and also because the authorship is, is different. So the authors uh, who know the domain will, uh, will write in their language uh, better. Uh, they, uh, there will be more details. So these are quasi-comparable or comparable corpora, and we cannot expect to find uh, complete texts there or complete paragraphs, but we could find their parallel sentences, uh, and we definitely should be able to find uh, their uh, like uh, translations of phrases. Uh, but the question is how to extract these phrases. Uh, so there has been a, a series of workshop on that. Uh, th this is a workshop on building and using comparable corpora. Uh, and uh, the method that I would like to highlight here is called lightly supervised training. It uh, goes back to 2008. And that's the basis of unsupervised machine translation. So essentially you start with some baseline machine translation system and you translate uh, the monolingual text in, uh, in one of the languages to the the other languages, and then you find similar sentences in the monolingual text on the target side. So that's uh, that's one of the uh, specific uh, ways how to how to deal with that. But the basis is uh, you rely on a machine translation system uh, of some uh, baseline run, and then improve it with uh, data that is synthetically uh, uh, translated or uh, located by uh, first synthetically translating it. Yeah. So the document alignment. Uh, uh, is, is uh, the next step. You already have obtained uh, the uh, the uh, two heaps of uh, text in the two languages, and you need to find pairs among that. So this is again something that many people have tried, uh, including students of mine at, uh, at the seminar. And here exactly, uh, we got the observation that finding the uh, source URLs is, is the tricky part. Uh, you can uh, use some uh, proper minimum pairing algorithm because you have a, you have a, uh, you have two sets of uh, elements and you want to find pairs and you can define criteria uh, of uh, of good pairing of a document. Uh, yeah, uh, so the uh, the largest uh, exercise uh, in this is obviously done by Parkroll. Uh, that's a European project uh, that uh, gathers this data. Uh, the Parkroll uh, uh, people try to align documents, so they assume that the whole document uh, has a translation of uh, of the um, uh, of, of its whole in the other language. Uh, we relaxed this assumption, and uh, three years ago, with a student of mine, we were trying to extract paragraphs. So the, the setting is different uh, in that if you have a page and the single page contains text and its translations, Paracrawl would not be able to find that. Our setup would break it into paragraphs, and we would still be able to, uh, to match these uh, two parts of text and, and uh, include them in our uh, parallel corpus. Uh, so uh, the, the precision and the recall were, were pretty good when uh, testing it uh, on the shuffle chain corpus. Uh, and uh, the main uh, uh, test was whether we can use the common crawl data, which amounts to uh, 150 terabytes of, uh, of uh, text in total, whether we can extract English check parallel uh, sentences from that. And it turns out that uh, the, uh, the number of extracted uh, uh, text uh, was quite small in the end. Uh, after all this huge processing, we ended up uh, with only uh, 100,000 uh, uh, Czech English sentence pairs. So that's, uh, that's much less than uh, that what we uh, gathered automatically. So the reason for this uh, low, uh, low uh, total data acquired was that Common Crawl uh, only samples from the webs. So Common Crawl does not contain the full uh, version, the, the full site copy of, uh, of each of the web. It only enters the web and uh, collects some random pages, uh, and uh, then it does this uh, in the uh, multiple languages independently. Uh, so the chance that you will have uh, the uh, source and target versions of, uh, of the text uh, in common crawl is pretty low. Uh, so uh, the way to proceed is actually first use this huge uh, effort uh, to identify the URLs and then use the URLs to do a full recrawl uh, of these web domains. And that way uh, you uh, can obtain a larger uh, data set. So that's something that, which we did uh, in the past for, uh, for specific uh, domains like medical translation, uh, but not for, not for the whole. Yeah. So now, uh, after finding the texts and finding pairs of texts, we have the next step. 
And the next step is to uh, align sentences. Uh, so uh, how do we align sentences for any pair of languages if we do not know uh, anything about the languages? So this is the exercise for you. Uh, you have the English text and you have the Hindi text. Uh, please align the sentences. Obviously, it seems quite complicated, but if you uh, take a while and look at the Hindi text uh, a little, you will realize that in the Devanagari script, there is a symbol that repeats, and there's this vertical pipe, uh, vertical bar, it's called the danda, and the danda is uh, the counterpart of the full stop. And we know that in English, sentences are separated generally by, by full stops. Uh, so, uh, what if we only broke the, sent the, the text uh, into individual lines and these symbols. Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, exactly what uh, we can do. And if the texts are translations of each other and you just put these lines side by side without any alignment, only putting them from top to bottom, you will see that the pattern of line lengths is nicely parallel across the two languages. So if the texts are translations of each other, and that is the assumption of sentence alignment processing, uh, then you can, uh, you, you will always find uh, sentences uh, like providing the same uh, or comparable amount of information. So if there is some part where the sentences are short, it will be, par uh, it will be uh, short in both languages. And if it's long, it will be long in, in both languages. And this is uh, this observation that sentence length is, is the critical uh, parallel part, and you don't have to look at the, at the words at all. This is the basis of the classical algorithm by Gale and Church. Uh, it's based on similar character length uh, of aligned sentences. It doesn't look at the words at all, and it uses just the dynamic programming style uh, to search for the best alignments. So it, this dynamic programming style is, is very similar to the uh, edit distance uh, algorithm. You're uh, finding the, the minimum edit distance uh, uh, in, in like grouping the sentences into, uh, into the left and, and right parts. Uh, so I've done my uh, homework uh, in the past years, luckily, and if you want to see the Gale and Church algorithm illustrated uh, as it proceeds, then uh, I would uh, recommend looking at this empty talk number seven on, uh, on sentence alignment uh, that, is, uh, that illustrates how, uh, how the dynamic programming uh, is, uh, is done. Uh, then, uh, after some years, uh, a colleague of mine uh, at the Faculty of Arts evaluated uh, Czech English uh, sentence uh, alignment quality, and uh, he compared uh, multiple uh, different algorithms because the Galen Church is, is a very baseline approach, but sufficient for many purposes. And he has figured out uh, that the uh, sentence alignment is nearly perfect, the automatic one. If you, especially if you combine multiple liners, uh, then you can rely on that. Uh, so the, uh, the standard tool, uh, the standard tool for uh, sentence alignment still these days is uh, the tool uh, by Daniel Varga called Honeyline. And uh, it's some uh, C code that still compiles well, uh, even on current machines, uh, and, and uh, runs reasonably. So if you, if you feed it with uh, reasonably sized uh, documents, it will, uh, it will uh, provide uh, good alignments. Uh, there were uh, improvements of the algorithm and the implementation, uh, but uh, they were not as easy to deploy, so people stick uh, with uh, Honeyline for uh, most of the time. Uh, okay, so that's the sentence alignment, uh, a task which is, uh, which is solved, essentially. And now uh, we can move to word alignment. So in word alignment, you are already given uh, a sentence into languages, and you need to align tokens. Uh, I'll keep saying words, but I actually mean tokens in these two languages. And the state of the art uh, is Giza++, which is uh, already uh, a 20 uh, year old uh, software. It's quite complicated to compile, and that's why people uh, tend to use fast align these days. The fast align uses uh, a reduced set of uh, alignment models, uh, and it can be pretty bad, especially if the, uh, if the training data is small. Uh, so uh, if you really strive for quality, I would still recommend to try compiling this Giza++ uh, tool. And the, uh, the nice thing about uh, this word alignment is that it is totally unsupervised. It only requires, uh, requires uh, sentence parallel texts, uh, and uh, it, will, it will find the, uh, the links between the words. Uh, so 
we will, we will see the, the basis of the algorithm in a second. Uh, the word alignments formally are restricted to a function. Uh, so for every source token, uh, you are indicating which of the target token corresponds to it, or optionally you can uh, make the alignment to, uh, to point to no word, so to a null. Uh, uh, so uh, this obviously limits it to one to many uh, 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 setting, uh, and uh, you need to do some trick, and that will uh, be also discussed uh, in the following, like how to get uh, the normal many to many alignments. And what Giza++ implements is a cascade of models. These models uh, originally come from IBM, and they were first used for the machine translation as such. Uh, but later on, uh, they, uh, the machine translation moved to the longer segments, uh, not word-level translation. And uh, the word-level uh, models, uh, the IBM 1 till uh, IBM 4, uh, remained uh, in use only for, uh, for the word alignment. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll discuss in close detail the IBM Model 1, which relies on the so-called lexical probabilities, the probabilities of translations of individual words, and uh, we'll only illustrate what the other models uh, do. Uh, yeah. So uh, I've already uh, said it only uh, creates many to, uh, to one links, uh, so it's actually used uh, twice in, in both directions. So let's, uh, let's now look at the details of uh, IBM Model 1. Uh, the lexical probabilities disregard the positions of words uh, in sentences, and they can be estimated fully automatically in the expectation maximization loop. Uh, if there are two copies of the same word, then uh, these lexical, uh, lexical alignments are highly inadequate because they do not distinguish whether uh, the first copy of the word corresponds to the first copy or, or the second copy. So it's, uh, the, uh, uh, this is only the, the basis of, uh, so the, the IBM Model 1 is good for finding a dictionary of word level translations, but it is uh, not good for translation uh, as such because it doesn't uh, consider the position of the, of the words in the sentence at all. Uh, so we'll now move to, uh, to slides uh, that were done by Philip Ken uh, several years ago. And uh, there we will uh, see the formulas for both the expectation and the maximization step. And there is uh, a trick uh, how to swap a sum and product in that, which makes uh, it tractable. And there is also a pseudocode. So I would highly recommend uh, uh, that you uh, re-implement uh, this IBM model one in your favorite language and uh, look at the outputs. Uh, so for my students, this is actually a homework. So I'll, I'll send you the details uh, how to do it, uh, what, what data set you should use. But this is, uh, this is a very good uh, exercise for also understanding uh, the expectation maximization uh, loop. And again, uh, if you want this illustrated in some live animation, uh, then uh, the empty talk number eight uh, covers that. Uh, okay, so now let's uh, yeah. uh, now let's move to the slides by Philip Kahn. Uh, as you see, it's already uh, 11 years old, uh, and still it's relevant technique. Uh, so, uh, the lexical translation, what, what, what does it entail? Uh, the lexical translation is what you will find in the dictionary. So, uh, if you want to know how to translate the word, you will open the dictionary and you will see that the word has multiple translations. So, if you are translating the German word house uh, into English, uh, in your dictionary you can easily find that it can be translated as house or building or home or household or shell uh, for, uh, for snails. Uh, so. Uh, we see that uh, there are many different translations, and if we are human users of the dictionary, uh, we need to somehow decide which of the translations is good. So what we normally do we're using paper dictionaries is that we uh, search back, uh, like uh, look up what, what shell is in German, and then we will say, oh, well, that this shell, this is like for, for snails and uh, other creatures. It's, it's not uh, like for, for humans. So it's probably not the right word if I want to translate uh, that I bought a new house. Uh, so uh, uh, this back translation with the help of the dictionary is something what people can use. Uh, because the dictionaries normally lack another important information. Some of these translations are more probable in uh, the given type of text, and some are very unprobable. So uh, if we had some probability scoring for these, it would be easier to decide. We would simply pick the highest scoring, uh, the, the most probable translation of, of a word. 
Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, so let's uh, let's talk about uh, obtaining these lexical uh, translation probabilities. Uh, so that means for each word, all the possible uh, target language words associated with uh, the likelihood, the the, the chance of, uh, of of that translation to, uh, to come up. So if we have a large corpus, and if we search. Uh, what uh, uh, the uh, the word house is translated to in in that corpus, uh, then we will find that the house, the German word, is translated as house uh, in English or building. Uh, and the most uh, common uh, uh, one is uh, is obviously uh, the house. And the shell is is a pretty unlikely translation. And we can only normalize these counts. And when we do, uh, we have defined uh, the uh, the probability, the lexical uh, lexical probability of uh, the uh, uh, of the English word given the uh, given the German word. So this is what we want to collect for all the possible words. Uh, the other view on on the data is the alignment. Uh, the alignment of words is uh, are these uh, lines or connections between uh, words and sentences uh, in in the corpus. So in the corpus, we will probably have a sentence pair like this: "Does house is Klein?" Uh, and in English, the house is small. And uh, we can align the words. We can indicate which words uh, translates to which. Uh, so here is the formal definition of the alignment. I've already told you that the alignment is captured as a function. It maps between uh, the English target word uh, at some position into the uh, source word uh, at some other position. So in the previous example, the alignment was simply mapping position one to position one, position two to two, and, and so on. The alignment function allow us, allows us to uh, reorder the words in any way. Uh, so uh, any uh, any reordering is is okay. Klein is the house. Uh, the house is small. Can be easily captured by the alignment function. Uh, then uh, it also can uh, produce one to many translations uh, because multiple words uh, in the target language. Uh, can map to the same word, uh, so multiple positions in the target language sentence can map to the same position in the source language. Uh, so this one to many is, is easily captured. So the, uh, the function doesn't have to be a, 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 a bijection. Um, another thing that we can easily do is uh, to drop uh, the words uh, of the source language uh, because we can uh, we can simply ignore that word if none of the target language words maps to that there will be no alignment link and that that source words will be dropped and if we add one more auxiliary symbol uh, to the source sentence we can also explicitly drop uh, words in the uh, in the other language uh, in the target language. So we can map uh, the word just to this position of zero, indicating that it has no counterpart uh, in, the, uh, in the other language. Uh, yeah, so now what is the IBM model one? So the IBM model one is a generative model uh, that uh, covers uh, uh, the first step of, uh, of the uh, the, of the translation, of the word-based translation, uh, and uh, it only relies, uh, the IBM Model 1, only relies on this lexical translation. So formally, we have a foreign sentence, uh, and uh, 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 we have the foreign sentence F uh, with, uh, of some length, and uh, the target English sentence E of some length as well, uh, and uh, we also uh, define the alignment uh, between uh, these uh, source and target words using the alignment function. So if we know the alignment, we define the IBM model one, and this is its definition, uh, the probability of the English aligned to the given source French is this is the product of the lexical probabilities in the alignment. So you know which words in French and English are aligned to each other you know in your dictionary what is the probability of, uh, of that pair of words, and you only multiply these probabilities together, so that is the lexical translation. The position of the words is not considered there at all. The, the positions are only used within the alignment function to like uh, see which words are at, at which positions. 
And then there is this normalization constant. If you look at the normalization constant, it uh, reflects the, uh, the length uh, of the uh, source and uh, target sentences. Uh, so uh, in the foreign language, in the source language, you have included the null position. There's this one more uh, possible alignment point or target point of the alignment. So for every word, and there is LE target words, you are deciding where you aligned it, uh, so you have LF plus one options to choose from, uh, and that's why we're normalizing this out. Uh, and uh, you uh, see uh, the word to which it was really aligned, and that word gives you the, uh, the translation probability. Uh, so this is the definition of the, uh, of the conditional uh, probability of target sentence uh, and alignment given the source sentence text. Yeah, let's uh, move to an example. So here is an example. The inputs that we have uh, is the lexical, uh, uh, the lexical probabilities. So the dictionary of all the uh, target words given the source word. So the source sentence uh, is does house is Klein. And for each of these words in our lexical uh, translation uh, table, uh, we know that does can be translated as the, that, which, who, and, and so on. And we know the, uh, the lexical probability of the translation. So that is the probability regardless any context. Similarly for house, uh, we have seen this before. Similarly for ist and similarly for Klein. And uh, then uh, if you consider the direct alignment uh, where the, word, uh, the words correspond uh, like monotonically to, to each other, then the probability uh, of the whole sentence in model one, uh, in IBM model one, is uh, this normalization times uh, the uh, product of the uh, lexical probabilities of the words. So uh, the was aligned to dust, so we uh, take this 0.7 multiplied with this 0.8, which corresponds to house. Uh, that's, uh, so you see that this, uh, the particular sentence that we had uh, on the previous slide uh, was uh, the most likely uh, lexical translation of, uh, of the source sentence, because for each of the words, uh, we use the top scoring, um, uh, top scoring element in the list. So this is the situation when we know the source sentence, know the target sentence, and know the lexical probabilities for each of the words. The IBM model one defines how do we calculate the probability of the whole sentence given, uh, the, uh, given the alignments and uh, given the words and, and given the source uh, sentence. But the question is, how do we obtain these, these lexical probabilities? So this, uh, yeah. So we would like to, uh, to somehow estimate these lexical probabilities from a parallel corpus. This is where we started. At the beginning, I told you, if you look up the word house in a big corpus, you will find that uh, the English version of that is house uh, most frequently. Uh, but that already relied on some alignment. Uh, so this is the chicken egg problem. If we had the alignments, uh, then we could easily estimate uh, the parameters in the generative model. And if we had the parameters in the generative model, uh, so uh, if we had this lexical dictionary of uh, pro word probabilities, then we could estimate the alignments. So the, uh, the, uh, the question is how to, how to tear this uh, loop apart. Uh, and that's where the uh, EM algorithm comes in. Uh, it is exactly uh, designed for that. If we had complete data, we would estimate the model. If we had the model, we could fill in the gaps in the data. And you do this loop uh, of uh, expectation uh, algorithm. You initialize uh, the modal parameters some way, in some way, randomly or uniformly. And you uh, improve uh, your data with the current bad model. Uh, that creates some new version of the data. You use this new version of the data to extract a new model, and then you repeat. So you use this improved model parameters uh, to complete the data and so on. So initialize uniformly, assign probabilities to the missing data, estimate the model parameters from uh, the completed data, and iterate because you have now a better version of, uh, of the model. So let's illustrate it. Uh, here is a corpus, a sample corpus between French and English, uh, and uh, you have three sentence pairs. Uh, one of the sentence pairs uh, contains La Maison and the house. Uh, the other sentence uh, pair contains La Maison Blue, the blue house, uh, and the third sentence contains La Fleur, the flower. 
uh, at the beginning, uh, your lexical probabilities uh, do not tell you anything. They are initialized uniformly. So the can be uh, linked with la equally likely as with meson. And house can be linked with la and meson uh, also equally likely. So at the beginning, you don't know uh, anything. But what you can do now is you observe uh, that some of the words did co-occur in this corpus. Uh, so after one iteration, the model will realize that uh, the co-occurred with la more often than it co-occurred with meson. And therefore, the alignment link between the and la will get stronger. Uh, and uh, if you proceed a little while, uh, for a little while, uh, then again, the alignments uh, for the good words, for the matching words will, will get stronger. And the alignments for the non-matching words get, uh, uh, get less important or less, less probable. And words that are not covered uh, in other sentences at all, such as this flower here, uh, they will get aligned to each other simply uh, because uh, the, uh, the probability mass has to be distributed somewhere and uh, the uh, la is already being occupied by the, so the flower is, is like uh, likely to, to choose the, the flare. Uh, so this is the, the pigeonhole principle. You have to put the, uh, if, 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 if pigeons are coming to, uh, to their uh, house, then uh, if there are more pigeons than holes, there must be a hole through which uh, two pigeons go. So that is uh, by uh, the full coverage of uh, the words, it's guaranteed that uh, the, the word flower will, will eventually get aligned to flour and that uh, the probability mass that was acquired by the and la will, uh, will like keep the pair, uh, the and la separate from, uh, from the flare. Okay, so at the end when it converges and uh, this has a global uh, optimum uh, and it also converges quickly, uh, we will know which words align to which words and based on that, we can easily extract the probabilities. So observing the whole corpus, we will uh, count how often uh, the was observed and how often of these total observations of the la was on, at the other end of, uh, of the alignment and that will give us the, the conditional probability. So at the end you use simply um, uh, maximum likelihood estimate for, uh, for these word uh, probabilities. So here is again the summary. Uh, the expectation maximization algorithm consists of two steps. In expectation step, you apply the model to the data. So the model is the dictionary of word translations. The data are the alignments. Uh, and uh, 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 yeah. so uh, using, uh, uh, well, actually the, 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 yeah, the model in the IBM model one is the formula that we had, uh, which defined the probability of the source sentence, target sentence, given the alignment. So that's the full model. So parts of the model are hidden. So the alignments between words and uh, using the model, we assign uh, the probabilities to, uh, what, what is that? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, well, in short, in the expectation step, you apply the model to the data. So you have the dictionary and you draw the alignments, uh, refine the alignments. Uh, and the maximization step is the other part. Uh, you have the alignments, you observe the data, uh, and you uh, change the model uh, so that uh, the probability of the observed data is maximal. So that's the maximization. Um, uh, so you estimate a new version of the model from the data. So you take the alignments uh, as, as truth and you collect the counts and update the model. And you repeat, uh, then you use this new model to apply the model uh, to the data. Uh, yeah. So uh, now the formulas and let's see how, uh, the, how detailed uh, can we cover that. Uh, here is a summary of the quantities that we are working with. We have the lexical probabilities. Uh, so that's the probability of the individual words. This is already some uh, iteration where we already know that the and la are quite linked together. And uh, uh, then uh, the and meson uh, uh, have some probability and, and la. So we have only two words in each of the languages to, uh, to consider. We have only the definite article, the uh, uh, or la. Uh, and we have only the word house or maison. And uh, the lexical probabilities are for all the, these pairs. So uh, either the definite articles can correspond to each other like the and la, uh, 0.7, 
uh, and uh, the the house and meson can correspond to each other. Uh, 0.8 uh, is the condition probability. Or the model also permits the uh, the crossed alignments uh, that uh, the uh, corresponds to meson, but that's not so likely. And then house corresponds to line, that's also uh, very unlikely. So this is uh, this is the, the lexical uh, translation table. Uh, all the words uh, corresponding to all the words with some probabilities. And uh, we have a corpus, and the corpus consists only of one sentence pair here in this uh, uh, single cal simple calculation. And the sentence pair is la maison, the house. Uh, and uh, what, is, what is here uh, displayed are all the possible alignments, uh, so all the possible alignment functions that we can define for this single sentence pair. So either the words are aligned uh, like monotonically in parallel, or the word la uh, is, corresponds to both the and house, and uh, meson is unaligned, or the other way around, or the alignments are, are swapped. And also this is simplified in that we do not uh, consider the null alignment. So uh, we have four different possible alignments for this given sentence pair. Uh, and the IBM model one is uh, this uh, probability. So that's, uh, we have, uh, you remember the definition of, uh, of that. Uh, that's the probability uh, of uh, the conditional probability of the target sentence and the alignment given the source sentence. And it is defined uh, as uh, the product uh, of the word level uh, the, the lexical probabilities and the normalization constant. So we, we ignore the normalization constant here, or maybe it uh, comes out to, uh, to one, I'm sure. So uh, the, uh, in this first uh, possible alignment, uh, the la and the are aligned together, 0.7, and house and meson are uh, aligned together. So if we multiply these two probabilities, we get 0.6 as the probability uh, of the whole sentence being aligned this way. So the corpus is given up front, but we don't know the missing part of the, uh, of the data is uh, the alignments. So uh, based on our model, we estimate that this interpretation of the data is the most likely. Another option uh, would be this uh, la producing both the and house and meson being unaligned. And there we have 0.7 times uh, 0.05. So that is uh, much less probable. Here is another option and the third option. So all these options uh, can be easily calculated. And we know that uh, this is the most, prob most probable option uh, now. So uh, uh, this, uh, this whole uh, up until here will be the expectation step. We have our model, we have the lexicon, we know the lexical probabilities, uh, and we are applying it to the data to find the missing points, so to find the alignments uh, and their probability. So uh, we have now uh, calculated the probability of each of these different alignments for the given sentence pair, and we know, and that's the trick, we know that one of the alignments was the true one. So, uh, we can uh, easily change that, uh, um, uh, uh, we can simply normalize these probabilities uh, and uh, find out what is the probability of the alignment given the source and target sentences. So this, this probability quantity, the IBM model one, uh, tells you what is the probability of the target sentence and alignment given the source. Uh, and it, it doesn't sum to one. But if we then later, after considering all the possible alignments, normalize it so that it sums to one, then we know the probability of the alignment uh, given the source and target sentences. So the trick that happens here is simply the normalization. We normalize uh, having observed all the possible alignments, calculated their probabilities in IBM model one, we normalize them, and we know uh, that this will sum to one, and like uh, if you have as input, to uh, the source and, and the target sentence, uh, this alignment is the most likely and it has the probability of 0.82 uh, and uh, that one is the least likely and, and so on. So now we can move, uh, so now we know how, uh, uh, so, so now we can move to the second step, uh, the, uh, the maximization step. We can create, we can observe the, the partial counts. Uh, so, 
uh, uh, the partial counts are, uh, are like uh, how often the word la was mapped to the word the and how often the word la was mapped to the house. So these counts are the basis for the re-estimation of the lexical probabilities. And uh, originally, all the alignment points here were equally likely, but now we have adjusted our assumptions, our estimates of that, uh, because we already know that, uh, that there was some previous knowledge, there was the model, and we, we have uh, considered all the alignments, and we have calculated the probability of each of these alignments. So now we trust these links more then we trust these links. So when, when, when estimating how often uh, the was linked with la, we can uh, consider this uh, with more weight uh, and this with less weight, less weight, and this would not contribute to that uh, at all. So the, uh, the idea uh, here is that you uh, first uh, don't know which words to align to which. You al allow that all of them align uh, to all of them equally likely. But you have some lexical knowledge. You uh, apply the model to the data, so that is the expectation step, and that refines the, the knowledge. You now know that this alignment, this interpretation of the sentence is more likely. And then you use this new knowledge, uh, uh, the refinement that we trust this more, for the better estimate uh, how often this word was connected with which. So the fractional counts in the uh, maximization step uh, are now the additions of, uh, of uh, the, the points that were uh, like when, when the alignment was seen uh, and uh, that uh, is, uh, with the weight that corresponds to the probability of the alignment as we have normalized it. So the and la was seen to be together twice of the four cases, but it's weighted. So it was 0.824 for this, from this picture, and 0 0.052 from this picture. So that is, this is the fractional count of uh, the uh, and la. Similarly for the other word pairs. And then, based on these counts, you can again do the, uh, the normalization uh, based on the words, and you will see that the has two translations, and uh, uh, so, the probability of the being translated into uh, one of those is, uh, is uh, uh, should, should sum to one, and, 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 you, and you normalize it, and you obtain the updated uh, lexical probabilities. So here, uh, a little bit of uh, more formulas uh, uh, that are behind that, uh, that simplified uh, slide uh, that we have just seen. Uh, so we need to compute the uh, IBM model one alignment. So that is the alignment, uh, so, so, so we need to compute uh, in, order, in order to be able to, uh, to estimate uh, the, uh, the fractional counts. We need to know how likely is the alignment given the source and target sentences. So we need to know the probability of the alignment given the source and target sentences among all the possible alignments between the source and target sentences. And we can apply the chain rule for this probability, uh, which uh, gives us uh, this, uh, this fraction. Uh, the numerator is the alignment, uh, is the definition of the IBM model one. So that is uh, the probability of the target sentence and the alignment given the source. And this is the, uh, the, uh, the probability of the target sentence given the source, regardless the alignment. Uh, so this is uh, like uh, if we consider all the possible alignments. So let's uh, let's work uh, further. Uh, let's let's uh, let's look at, at the numerator uh, at the denominator. Uh, let's look at uh, how do we calculate the probability of the target sentence given the source, considering all the possible alignments. Well, that's exactly what uh, what these formulas say. Uh, it will be sum over all possible alignments. Uh, and for each of the possible alignments, we will rely on the IBM model one. So the IBM model one is the definition which says uh, that you should uh, like uh, multiply the lexical probabilities of the words and, and normalize it in some way. Uh, so what is it? What does it mean to sum over all alignments? It means to sum over all the possible uh, the dot filled matrices of, of which words corresponded to which. So in the first column, uh, you. Uh, uh, are indicating which target word uh, is, is connected to which source word. In the second column, uh, you do it uh, for the second word and, and so on until the end of, uh, of the target sentence. 
so this is just uh, uh, an explanation of, of the sum. It sums over all the columns in the matrix. And for uh, each uh, such alignment, when you know the matrix of alignment points, uh, you are uh, using the uh, definition of the IBM model one uh, of the probability of the sentence, which says uh, normalize depending on the uh, on the length of the sentences and uh, multiply all the lexical probabilities, and these are those where the the matrix uh, matrices have, have, have the ones uh, indicating the uh, uh, the positions. Yeah. So uh, this uh, on this slide. So what what we are after? We are after finding the probability of the alignment given the source and target sentences. Uh, we have used the chain rule uh, to uh, find the definition of the IBM model one. Uh, that's the model which relies on the lexical uh, translation probabilities and also uh, the full uh, probability of the target given the source across all the alignments. Now we have work out uh, how do we calculate the probability of the target given the source across all the alignments, that is summing over all the possible alignments. And uh, this is something which would not fit nicely into the uh, denominator because uh, having a sum in the denominator uh, is, uh, is something that, uh, difficult to work with. So the next step that happens here is a trick uh, that swaps the sums and the products. And uh, th this will be another uh, exercise uh, for homework uh, to realize that you can uh, do this swap of sum uh, and, uh, and product simply by factoring out uh, elements that appear in, in more, uh, uh, like uh, that, that appear several times in, in that calculation. So this is just uh, uh, an algebraic uh, manipulation with the formula. Uh, so that in the end, we arrive at uh, knowing that the probability of the target sentence given the source can be uh, estimated by multiplying over all the target positions, the summation over all the source words that uh, the target can be uh, mapped to, considering their lexical probabilities. Uh, this is the trick. So you should go. Uh, you should go over this formula uh, to realize how the sum and the product were swapped. If you want some uh, summarization of the trick, uh, this is the target sentence. This is the source sentence. Uh, one of in one of the calculations, you are considering uh, the sum of all pairs. So all that uh, full graph. Uh, and that full graph, the sum of all the pairs, where each pair is, is a multiplication of, uh, of the um, uh, other things, that can be regrouped uh, into a product of, uh, of summations. So that is uh, just a quick summary of what is happening here. And uh, now let's put it together. Remember, we need to know how likely are the alignment points, what, uh, how much do we trust them for a given source and target sentence. If we know the probability of the alignment of the matrix of zeros and ones, uh, then uh, we can use this uh, to collect an up updated fractional counts, uh, and uh, that will refine our lexical, uh, lexical translation uh, probabilities. So to get the probability of the alignment given the source and target sentences, we had the chain rule applied, and now we plug in what we have uh, simplified. So here we plug in simply the definition of the IBM model one alignment, and here we plug in uh, now after the trick, the swapped product and sum. Uh, uh, so this is all the possible alignments uh, of, of the sentences, uh, uh, of the given pair of sentences, uh, and uh, considering the lexical alignment uh, between the words in those sentences. And here, uh, the normalizations cancel out, and the product can be uh, done after uh, the uh, the uh, division and not uh, vice versa. So this is uh, what uh, what makes the computation tractable. It's uh, this is simply the norm this is the simple normalization that you have seen in the in the summary slide. So we have now a good estimate how likely some alignment between words uh, in the source and target sentences is, and we use this knowledge uh, to uh, create the fractional counts. And uh, then uh, we use these uh, uh, fractional counts uh, to 
uh, get the new uh, lexical probabilities. So we consider uh, to what all other words the word uh, was uh, with which word, which we observe with which all other words uh, the words was uh, the, the word was uh, linked. So what is the sum of fractional counts, and uh, what is the fractional count that uh, falls to this particular uh, the, the, the target word, and uh, we just divide that. That's a that's the maximum likelihood estimate. Here is the implementation. So this is the pseudocode uh, that uh, you should, as your homework, uh, simply uh, implement your favorite language. And uh, if you do it, uh, okay. So what is here? Yeah. Uh, and if you do it, uh, then uh, you can plot for yourself a similar uh, gradual uh, improvement of the uh, of the model and uh, the alignment of the data. So uh, this is another way of illustrating what the EM does. Uh, the model is the lexical probabilities, which words are or can be translated as which words, uh, and uh, regardless their position. So this is the dictionary. Uh, we initialize the dictionary, we initialize the modal uh, with uh, uniform probabilities. So at the beginning, uh, we do not know whether black in Czech corresponds to Bili or uh, black in English corresponds to the Czech word Bili or Cherny, uh, or whether it corresponds to, uh, to Doom, which is house, or to Pes, which is dog. So at the beginning, we do not know anything. All we have uh, is the corpus. The corpus has, uh, in this case, uh, three sentence pairs. White house is uh, paired with Billy Doom. White dog is paired with Billy Pess, and black dog is paired with Cherny Pess. So this is our corpus, and these are the uh, alignment uh, uh, probabilities uh, in that um, uh, in that corpus. Uh, so if we do not know anything about which words correspond to which, we also do not know anything about which words correspond to which in a particle sentence pair. Uh, but we take this, we take these fractional counts as given, and we use these new observations to estimate a better dictionary. So uh, here we observe that Billy and uh, White and Billy and House were like equally likely. <clears throat> We know that Billy summed to one, so Billy was surely linked to something. It was either linked to white or to house, but we don't know which one. So uh, these are the, the, the uncertain, uh, are certain alignments, fractional counts of point half and point half. And uh, here we will collect uh, uh, with which words Billy uh, was uh, was linked, and uh, here we normalize it the, the other way around. So, uh, we know that white was linked uh, with Billy, and that happened in two sentences, so one half and one half, and uh, white was also linked to uh, doom, that's here, that's another one half, and uh, with pes, and that's here, that's the other half. So in total, white was seen uh, with four fractional counts of a half, and of these four fractional counts, uh, two uh, belong to the word Billy, and one uh, each of the two remaining ones uh, belong to Doom and uh, Pass, respectively. So if you look at the fractional counts uh, where white was linked to some words, then you see it was more often linked to Billy than to the other uh, words. And uh, another interesting observation from this corpus is that white was never linked to Cherny. So there was not a single sentence where white would co-occur with Cherny, and Cherny in Czech means black. So after the very first observation of the corpus, where we didn't know anything about which word is which, the non-occurrence of white and Cherny already ruled out uh, the, the chance of white having the, the meaning of black. So this is, this is the first observation, and we already know, like a flat zero, uh, the probability of zero that white translates to Cherny. So that helps already a lot. <clears throat> For the other words, we are not yet quite certain. Uh, we know that white is most likely Billy, and uh, it could be also, uh, with some probability, Doom or, uh, or uh, Pes. 
uh, and only later, as as we proceed with the uh, with the calculation, uh, these uncertainties were will uh, tear apart, and also the probability of white and and Beely will will grow. So now we have an improved model, uh, and we use again the expectation step to draw the new alignments here. And now for the uh, for the uh, for the first sentence. We already know that white and Beely are more likely uh, to belong to each other than white and, and house. So that's why this, uh, this dot is lighter. And uh, the house and Beely, that is still not, not decided. Uh, and uh, only after one more iteration, it will uh, turn out that house is more likely linked to doom than it is linked to, uh, to white. So hopefully, uh, with this illustration, uh, you uh, see how the EM algorithm gradually uh, discovers uh, the uh, knowledge which is uh, contained in the corpus. Uh, that's the knowledge of which words occur with which. Uh, and um, uh, it, it reveals uh, uh, that uh, some of the words can be translated as some and can, some cannot be. And it also allows, uh, in each of the expectation step, it also allows us to draw the alignment links in the corpus to manually validate whether uh, it, is making, uh, it, is, it makes sense or, or not. So we are gradually improving the model and gradually improving the data. Uh, so let's, uh, let's quickly summarize what the other models do. So that it was, this was a quite detailed look at the IBM model one for lexical translation. Uh, then the IBM model two adds absolute reordering models. So it considers whether the word is at the beginning of the sentence or at the end or in the middle, what the exact position. Uh, model three finally allows uh, to uh, translate multiple, uh, a single word into multiple words. Uh, and uh, model four is relative reordering. And then uh, the deficiency uh, of, of that is uh, that the probability, uh, uh, probability mass of sentences is not fully exploited. So there is some probability mass not, uh, not linked with anything. So that is fixed in model five, but that was computation too expensive and no one uh, ever used it. Uh, so uh, in pictures, uh, this, is, uh, this is the uh, the way the IBM models uh, or IBM model four uh, uh, proceed, uh, proceeded when it was used for translation, but that's exactly what it is uh, being used for uh, in uh, word alignment these days. So the idea of IBM model four is that you have some source sentence. Uh, the source sentence is first uh, processed with the fertility model that for some words says uh, they don't have any translation. For some words, it's like prepare slots. So the probability of slap having a three word translation in Spanish is, is very likely. So the model will pr prepare three slots for that. Uh, then there is the probability of in introducing words that have no counterpart in the, uh, in the source sentence. Uh, then we have the lexical translations. Here uh, we see that Mary is most likely translated to Maria. The particular strange thing here is that uh, we use the same uh, entry in the lexical translation probability for translating this, these three versions of slap. Uh, so this slap should be translated as daba, una, bofetada, step by step. And it will be only the language model which will then suggest these words in, in their order because here the lexical probabilities uh, like are based on the same, uh, on the same part of the table. And then uh, finally, there is some uh, distortion model which allows the, the words to be uh, further reordered. So that's the IBM model four. Uh, and uh, these days, uh, the alignments are used uh, in two directions. Uh, so you align English to Spanish and you align Spanish to English. Uh, remember, each of those is a function. So uh, each of them allows only one to many or many to one uh, alignment points. And then you multiply, uh, then, then you put them together either with intersection or union. And it turned out that uh, for, uh, if you want to extract uh, some plural dictionary, if you want to extract some dictionary for humans, you want the reliable link, so you'll rely on the intersection. If you want to extract phrase translations for the phrase-based empty that will be discussed uh, in, in the upcoming lecture, 
then uh, you uh, do something between the intersection and union, which was called grow dark final. So one particular heuristic, how to, uh, how to Im enlarge the intersection, but not get the, the full, full union yet. And there were also like principled algorithms that, that used optimizations like minimum edge cover. Uh, yeah. So the popular symmetrization heuristics is, is this grow dark final where uh, you include only no, only points that are already in close vicinity uh, from from the intersection ones. Uh, now troubles with the word alignment. Okay, so let's let's uh, step a little bit back, especially back from the formulas, and let's consider if if word alignment as a task makes sense from the linguistic point of view or not. And uh, uh, again, I, I base this on some observations that we've made. Uh, uh, we have uh, checked what the humans do because we have uh, we have been manually aligning uh, words, uh, and uh, we see that. It was uh, quite difficult for humans to align auxiliary words. Uh, so uh, the words where people had a disagreement were in English the words like to, the, of, a, uh, and in Czech the auxiliaries uh, were comma or the tokens comma, sev, uh, na, and so on. So, so words which do not have any counterpart in the target language. Uh, these were these were the hardest uh, the hardest uh, words to, to align for humans. So if you ask two humans to draw uh, to draw word alignments, uh, they will make errors in uh, in functional words. And uh, then I mm, compared this observation uh, with uh, the performance uh, of uh, uh, automatic alignment as uh, run by Giza of two models. One was the baseline model, and then some improved model which, uh, which uh, simplified the token, so somehow like uh, improved the, uh, the setting so that Giza had a better chance to align the words. And uh, the, thing, uh, the observation here to make is that uh, for tokens uh, where, uh, uh, for tokens where humans uh, have had no troubles uh, in in aligning that. So this is these two uh, two lines. Uh, there, uh, the improved model uh, indeed imp uh, like uh, increased uh, the uh, the number of tokens that were well aligned compared to uh, the pro uh, to tokens where uh, the Giza prediction did not match uh, humans. Uh, so. Uh, for the parts of the tokens where humans had a clear idea how to align words, Giza was able to, to discover this, especially, and, it, and we saw the improvement. When we, when we uh, like improved uh, the processing of the data, we got better alignments from Giza. If we looked at the tokens where humans did not have the, uh, a clear idea of what, uh, which words correspond to which, then there the improved processing had no effect. It did not improve, it did not, uh, it did not guess better what the humans want because the humans were not able to tell what they want. Uh, so the, the main message of this is that if your task is ill-defined, uh, then uh, there is no point in, improving, in trying to improve your algorithm. You first need to have a well-defined task where humans agree, and when, you, when humans agree, it, is, uh, it makes sense to, to work on improving the algorithm. So always, whenever you are doing any type of annotation, always estimate the inter-annotator agreement uh, and focus uh, on the rules for annotation so that the task is well-defined. And in a well-defined task, uh, you, can, uh, you can use the machine and it makes sense to, to work on automatic algorithms. But without a clear definition, uh, you don't get any measurable improvement uh, at all. So the reason why, uh, why we have some uncertainty in aligning uh, uh, has been uh, also considered by uh, other uh, colleagues, and they did it for Chinese and English, and they observed that these um, possible or, uh, or strange alignments uh, between English and uh, Chinese uh, are essentially of two types. Uh, in some, uh, it's 96% uh, of, uh, of alignment points. So the first type is uh, the language specific function word, which does not exist in the other language. So that's the English articles. Uh, they are not present in Chinese. They are also not present in Czech. So these words are hard to align. And the general uh, way uh, is to align them uh, to the uh, counterpart of the governing word. So uh, over the earth, when translated into Chinese, uh, 
should be linked with this go over an earth in Chinese uh, so that the earth corresponds to the earth. That's the sure alignment. That's easy. And this the, which relates to the English word in the English side, should be linked to the corresponding uh, word in the target language. So this is the way that, uh, that linguists normally uh, treat this uh, when, when uh, aligning words. But uh, they know that uh, it does not make any sense to ask uh, what is the Chinese counterpart for the English different article? There is no counterpart. So uh, asking uh, to, to put the alignment point here is a bad question in the first place. And here is the other role, uh, other, other situation uh, which, where it happens. So it's a role equivalent pairs that are not lexical equivalent. So uh, if something was discovered in English, uh, in, uh, in Chinese there is the content word to discover, and there is some passive marker, but it's not a lexical uh, translation of the word uh, to be in, in English past. So that's why uh, it may seem superficially from the data that this like aligns well, the was with the passive marker, but it's something that you would never put into a dictionary that was is translated as a passive marker. Uh, so the, the, the meaning of was is, is passive marker. So this is why people would, would like uh, uh, have problems putting the alignment point here. So here is uh, a similar observation that we uh, made a few years before that in a for check. Uh, again, uh, the sentence is uh, full of uh, various auxiliary uh, words. Uh, I do not think they, uh, their customers would like it very much. Nemyslím, že by se to jejich zákazníkům moc líbilo. This word nemyslím corresponds primarily to this thing, but it also includes the meaning of I do not. So the single check word corresponds to one, two, three, four, uh, four English words in some way. And only one of them is the lexical uh, translation. And the other are uh, elements of uh, English word that contribute to the meaning in some way. So the interesting thing that happened here was that in that year, two papers uh, annotated the same test set uh, with uh, like totally independently without knowing knowing each other and we met uh, at the same conference uh, and we realized oh we were doing uh, like we were doing double annotation they were doing single annotation so we realized we have a, a three-way annotation of the of the same data set uh, so uh, did we do it the same way and the great observation was Yes, we both, the two groups independently, defined the same, uh, the same rules for, for the annotators. So it, we ended up with a three-way annotation uh, just because uh, the linguistic uh, background uh, of, of both these groups was, was the same. So that's, uh, that's, the good, uh, that's the good news. If there is a theory, an established theory, uh, that is shared uh, in, in some uh, community uh, of, of people, uh, then two groups can, can do the same task with Without knowing uh, of each other, so what is uh, what is the uh, what is the theory that that led to this? It's the tectogrammatic layer. The tectogrammatic layer is something which is well covered in many uh, courses in in uh, Prague uh, so computational linguistic studies, and. Uh, the, the very essential idea is that you draw trees for sentences, and only content-bearing words have a node. Uh, and auxiliary words are hidden in this deep syntactic representation, in this tectogrammatical representation. So if you take the sentence that was on the previous slide, nemyslím, že by se to jejich zákazníkům moc líbilo, I don't think uh, their customers would like it very much. The auxiliaries are marked uh, in red here, and they uh, are hidden as node attributes only within these trees. So if you observe these trees, you can see that they are like similar. It's, it's easier to align the nodes in the trees because uh, they correspond to each other more. It's lexical, uh, like uh, lexical translations. Uh, there is this closer number of nodes uh, than there is the number of, of words because many of these words are just auxiliaries. So that's, uh, that makes the, uh, the alignment task easier for humans uh, and therefore better defined and therefore easier to, uh, to uh, improve uh, for the machine. So that's what my colleague did uh, some years ago. He was aligning textogrammatical nodes instead of words. Uh, 
auxiliary words uh, didn't clutter the task, and uh, it improved uh, the the task as such improved the uh, the uh, alignment the, the human uh, agreement on on the task. Uh, the application uh, to phrase based MT was done some uh, some years after that, and there were indeed a little uh, improvements. Uh, but the main use was to extract a dictionary for uh, for a deep syntactic machine translation system. And the main observation was that this is a better defined uh, task. So it's, it's, uh, that was the good side. Uh, we were able to redefine the task so that it uh, makes more sense and it's easier than to automate. Uh, but there is a disadvantage, there is a cost. It becomes language dependent. You need to define this textogrammatic layer uh, for uh, all the uh, all the languages, and you have have to rely on complex tools to get to the annotation in the first place. Uh, there is uh, a related approach which is uh, unsupervised, and uh, it's called Leaf. The idea here is that you distinguish explicitly in the model which of the words are uh, content bearing or head words, and which of these words are auxiliaries, the non head words, and uh, the model has then the capacity to link only head words across the languages, and the non-head words are always attached within the given language. So that's exactly uh, the uh, the same assumption that lies behind uh, the uh, the tectochromatic layer, where uh, the uh, the auxiliaries are specific to a given language, and you attach the auxiliaries within the language to their head words, and then you only uh, align uh, these head words across the languages. And obviously, you can also delete some some head words and and like introduce. Uh, insert some some head words. So this is something which is linguistically more adequate. Uh, it has never quite caught up. So it would be still interesting to revive this uh, uh, this approach. Uh, and with the with the new machine learning methods, I'm sure that it would uh, perform better. So uh, we are uh, closely coming to the end. Uh, so uh, the main use of word alignment these days is for extracting dictionaries. Uh, the main use before uh, neural MT came was. Uh, to use the word alignments in phrase-based machine translation. And uh, we have already discussed why the word alignments are problematic from the linguistic point of view, um, uh, but they were also problematic from the statistical point of view uh, because these word alignments were in no relation with the phrases then, uh, that were then used. So, so the, uh, the probabilities were kind of ill-defined. Uh, so there was, there was a technique how to move from word alignment to true phrase alignment based on the phrase-based model. But it didn't bring enough uh, improvement in translation quality, so, so that's why people uh, don't use it. Uh, I would just like to warn that if you have a better translation of a text, uh, then the alignment between individual words can even become less uh, reachable. Uh, so to get in shape for the 90s uh, would be nicely translated into a Czech as aby vstoupila do 90 let v co nejlepší formě. And there is no clear word level correspondence between these two, two phrases. So a nicer translation uh, is, is often less uh, lexical. And uh, here is another example. Teď se zdá, že tyto trasy začnou fungovat až v lednu. Now those routes aren't expected to begin until January. So uh, the sentences uh, actually swap the interval range. So uh, the English says to begin until, unexpected to begin until January, and the Czech says they will start functioning only in uh, January. And uh, these nicer wordings uh, make even the tectogrammatical trees of a very different shape. So uh, there, uh, the tectogrammatic layer does not help. If the translation is not literal enough, then there is uh, little point in, in aligning it. Okay, so let's summarize. Uh, we have started with parallel data and uh, illustrating how uh, they affect the translation quality. Uh, so we know that the more and better data you have, the, the better translation quality you get. And then we have talked about all the methods, starting with document alignment, uh, and uh, or finding the document document alignment, then sentence alignment, which is essentially a soft task. Uh, then we have discussed the word alignment because it is still important for extracting uh, dictionaries for for humans or for some interpretation of what neural MT does. Uh, but uh, it is 
as a task, it is ill-defined. Uh, it's not the case that the words would correspond to the words in the other language uh, very well. Uh, there are also the, the heuristics for symmetrizing the two directions of the alignment, which is uh, strange from the linguistic point of view. It's, it's just because uh, our math skills are not, not good enough. Uh, so uh, beyond word alignment is where we still uh, should go. It makes sense. Uh, the phrase based uh, uh, the phrase alignment is uh, is uh, too tied to phrase based empty and that's uh, surpassed as, as an approach uh, for most situations but uh, the linguistically adequate type of alignment is uh, is interesting so either getting this deep syntactic layer uh, uh, automatically uh, and then uh, using the uh, uh, and, and also in some uh, language uh, independent way uh, so universal dependencies is the is the way to go or deep uh, universal dependencies uh, and or uh, we can simply uh, revive the the idea of leaf where words are distinguished between head words and non head words and only head words are linked across uh, the languages uh, so thanks for attention, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, you now know uh, uh, that uh, the task of word alignment is ill-defined, but sometimes still useful, and hopefully you'll also do your homework of implementing IBM Model 1 in your favorite language. Thank you.